All right. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this event, and also congratulations on the 20-year anniversary of the Center for East Asia Studies. And I feel very much at home here, and it's uh, also, to me, it's also kind of homecoming, because I actually, when the center was first founded, I, I was um, one of those who actually tried to move books into that room. <laughs> uh, so it's very, um, yeah, anyways, congratulations for the um, achievement of the 20 years, um, really glorious history. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what digital media can do to activate cultural heritage. And um, so I founded uh, Harvard Chem Lab, and part of our mission is precisely to do that. Uh, so today I'm going to introduce one project. And it started with two art objects, um, both from 8th century, one from uh, Dunhuang Cave, another from um, uh, Golden Hall of uh, uh, Horiyoji and Nara, and both of these works are in Hara Museum. Uh, to the left is the original one, to the right is a copy of the wall painting. So what we did was uh, we make them dance. So as you can see through digital media, we created um, this, this um, performative uh, in our, uh, immersive performance and uh, digital performance. Um, the point is not to showcase technological wizardry, or, uh, but we actually asked larger questions. So the first question is why the statue need to dance? And the second question is why the wall painting need to leave the wall? And overall, we ask the question, what is the purpose of such attempt? The digital animation and what might call this kinetic sculpture are not merely meant to jazz up cultural heritage. In fact, um, they are not just technological knockoff of the real thing. But in fact, as I will argue, that they may even be better than the real thing. All right, this is probably hard for museum people to accept, but by the end of the talk, I hope I can convince you somewhat, at least. Um, the other, so this is the installation, uh, digital uh, performative installation that we have with all these uh, screens, showing case um, the different uh, movements of uh, based or derived from the, the statues. In fact, uh, uh, these abstract forms uh, alternate um, between the real looking statues and the, uh, some of these active forms, and they form some kind of continuum. So, um, but this raised all kind of questions. Among them, the key question is, is this exhibition hall, or is this some kind of post-traumatic theater in the sense that you know, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are away, we, we have sort of outgrown the proscenium-centered uh, theaters and, and come into some kind of performance space where digital media can perform and, and function as the main protagonist of this whole thing. So it again raised the question of the space, this, this, this uh, nature of this performative uh, genre. And one might say that it is actually more theatrical and performative than traditional exhibition hall, but is less bound to uh, proscenium-centered theater. And it's, in fact, as I will argue, more faithful in spirit to cultural heritage. And I know this is a big argument, but we'll see. So in any case, um, what I'm saying is that this kind of digital medium, to some extent, is more faithful 
is truer or closer to the heart of the dynamic of Buddhist universe, Buddhist imaginary universe. All right. So this is what the, the, our display uh, space, um, which is uh, our cam lab space, is now called uh, cam lab cave. For those of you who have a chance to visit Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's 485 Broadway at the lower level. And um, uh, we have uh, you know, a number of spaces, but you, uh, chief among them, the immersive theater to the right and the infinity room in the left, and the, the, the dance project that I'm talking about today uh, is the one uh, that takes place on, uh, on the, on the, in the infinity room. All right. So again, as I said, the starting point of real, actually real art objects, and, and, and these three um, uh, panels um, are quite precious be, uh, because they're they are copies, they're early copies of the uh, horology uh, Golden Hall mural, uh, which rank among uh, the highest artistic achievement in Asia in the uh, around 700. And unfortunately, a, a fire broke out in 1949 and seriously damaged uh, uh, these wall paintings. And um, so what we now have is, is just what survive of, of the, of the painting, as you can see. So uh, the, the, pain, the murals are, are in, in this, in this uh, golden hall. Um, now, the Harvard uh, copy is actually quite a mystery because um, I, from my initial research, that, um, the uh, Japanese government actually started the copying of these murals in the 1930s. But these paintings, ours actually entered according to the uh, accession number in 1926, so I need to still need to find out uh, how this early copy actually preceded the documented uh, uh, official copy that the Japanese government did. But in any case, as you can see, that it preserve uh, our copy preserve uh, the kind of pre-fi condition, and they are truly, truly aesthetically stunning and beautiful. Um, now. The memory of this fire, of course, is 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 traumatic, and and of course it, it just you know caused pain in all of us, uh, uh, knowing that you know such a great uh, space uh, 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 is kind of serious damaged, and so uh, the Japanese colleagues have done a wonderful job in digitally reconstituting that. Um, a golden hall space, and, and um, so for the first time we could study these paintings uh, the, the, uh, by bypassing the problem we face in studying from the print media. Because you know, if you do the print media, you, you look at the illustrations, it's very hard to put them in spatial relation to one another. But uh, with this, you could actually screw around and, and close up and draw close and it's also very, very elegantly done, of course. Um, so hats off to them, and you know, it's really uh, highly respected uh, work. But, but it also raises uh, further questions. Should we actually consider the Golden Hall space, the Buddha Hall space, as the ultimate reference point, or as the standard reference point, or as the prototypical space by which all these other similar works are to be judged and considered or measured? Uh, obviously, the answer is no, because uh, this same program could actually exist in other uh, uh, forms and spaces. In other words, when you ask what is this space that these paintings combine to create, it is obviously not just Buddha Hall. And so if we look at the uh, the, the, the painting, and then we know that, in fact, it, it, it is so closely, well, it's certainly a president. Um, it came from China, of course, the, the, at least the design or the stylistic model come from China. And then you, you find in Dunhuang Cave, a seventh century cave, uh, similar compositions and similar designs, and that, that um, showcase the, you know, it's not just the Buddha Hall, but also Buddhist cave as well. But once we, once we have Buddha Hall and Buddha Cave, a Buddhist cave as the 
space uh, arena to showcase these, these works, then the, then the next focus is, of course, not just cave as well. So what is this space that both the Buddha Hall and the cave share, and that actually is somehow nowhere to be found? It's a, it's a, it's a virtual space, right? So that's a key point I'm, I'm making here. Um, so give you a sense of how, um, what's really going on here, um, and also to revert back to the question I raised earlier, why the wall painting need to leave the wall? In fact, uh, some of the uh, details in the painting already cue us. In other words, if you look at this beautiful downcast eyes and this pack of compassion and body suffer, seem to direct our attention to certain detail, to some event that is taking place here. And if we follow their gaze, we find that, in fact, they, they, their focus is really on the pond where the lotus sprout and then the uh, spirit uh, would emerge, getting reborn from the lotus born pond, the spirit of the deceased, in fact. So, and this composition then further evolved. So by the time we get to uh, 7th century, uh, this is a full-blown, this is a detailed full-blown pond scene where you see the newborn uh, children uh, on the lotus pot, and, um, and that is the attention, that is the event uh, being sh uh, showcased here. Um, so with that, of course, there's a concerted performance going on here. And then you could see that uh, we were looking at this, and then that downcast eyes would belong to this bodhisattva looking down, and in fact, they all kind of focus on this central event. And then in celebration, in concert, you would have dancers, uh, as you can see here, uh, celebrating and music and so forth. So that naturally leads us to ask the bigger question, like why dancers in such scenes? Are the dancers merely entertainment um, in, in this context? Um, the, the answer is no, they're not just, they're more than entertainment. They're actually, this, the primary thrust or crust here is not that they dance to entertain, but that actually dance is a matter of life and death. Dance is about movement, about process, about disembodiment, uh, disembodied spirits uh, getting reborn, and then by virtue of this dancing uh, choreography, we are made mindful of the invisible movement that is taking place, which is the disembodied spirit trying to get somewhere and getting uh, reborn. So, and that's you can see here. So in other words, um, what we try to get at is, is, is that movement. That movement, um, movement often is best uh, represented by way of uh, dance, uh, because dance is an art that captures movement, that showcase movement. So, um, uh, so this is uh, how we want to um, extrapolate that key aspect of this performance and try to showcase that, in fact, that is really what is really going on. It is not on the walls. It's actually in between the walls. So the key uh, space here is some kind of, you might say, intramural space, this kind of interstitial process that is invisible, but that is actually uh, the center of gravi uh, gravity. Um, all right. So what is our, I mean, it's, this is not, when, we, when, we, when we're doing this, we, we, we hardly theorize. We, we, we just try to be creative, try to work out things so that we can try to capture certain Buddhist logic. But in hindsight, uh, as I reflect on this, in fact, we, there's a genealogy and, uh, that we uh, um, inadvertently uh, enacted 
the latter stage, uh, the logical outcome of that genealogy, which is that um, our space stands in a very interesting relationship to an earlier space. In 1933, the uh, Hungarian um, artist, um, Mahalaji Naji, actually uh, had this uh, room of a time. Um, he designed this, this space and it didn't get um, um, uh, materialized, but then uh, we could get uh, that his, his other ide ideas, uh, uh, blueprints, were actually put in place uh, as in uh, the light pop uh, that, that was uh, done. So, yeah, actually, Harvard has a one, one, uh, has a one, one model uh, uh, built upon this. So, but, so in what way, um, this moment, this room of our, our time could be seen as the president of what we do. Well, it has to do with the whole notion of what's the revolutionary turn that was taking place um, in Mahology Naji's time. It is a turn from the traditional um, categories of plastic art, such as uh, sculpture, that rely heavily on body, um, that um, relied on the sort of pre 20th century notions of space. So you have mass, you have volume, you have gravity, and then everything uh, comes down to that sort of bodily volume, bodily mass, and so forth. So sculpture as a genre actually is very much built on that, that kind of gravity bound kind of uh, uh, notion of the world and our, our body. But with the Industrial Revolution really accelerating uh, our sense of time and space, uh, movement become more important and also the sort of, you know, with Einstein's uh, relativity and all these other revolutionary modes of thinking, you essentially have different sense of time and space. And space no longer is Newtonian space. Space can be pliant. Well, certainly is a highly relativized. Movement is big because cars, uh, trains, um, airplanes, uh, these define our new sense of reality that has, um, has uh, really break down the more traditional notion of time and space. Um, so with that, of course, um, uh, 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 that dynamic is fully captured in this, in, in, in um, 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 Mohaliji Naji's uh, sculpture. So, so the key here is that you have this revolutionary turn instead of the uh, a volume, uh, pr giving priority to volume, mass, and so forth. What you have here is the void, well, this is I follow uh, Peter Weibel's formulation. You have void instead of volume. You have a vacuum instead of mass. You have virtuality instead of reality. You have abstraction instead of figuration. You have air instead of solid. You have a shadow instead of light. You have weightlessness instead of the heavy objects. So overall, the emphasis on the negative space that gives us the uh, interstitial kind of uh, sense of reality. Uh, things get uh, virtual, um, um, get um, immersive, and, and, and the, the space is, in, in, in fact, invisible. <laughs> uh, nowhere to be found, but it's also everywhere to be found. In other words, what, what, what this kind of sculpture defined is a, a different kind of universe, right? So, Mahalaji Naji um, provides a standard, well, a good start, a reference point for us, but we also do some things, well, here's also a light drawing that he did, um, as you can see. So, so in some ways, um, there's a, there, you, we, we could sense a certain continuity of what we do and what he did. But on the other hand, I think uh, we are, we're doing uh, something more. Um, uh, Maholi Laji and his generation and all that um, kind of uh, light drawing and um, um, mechanical simulation of uh, space and time uh, somehow became obsolete 
by the mid 20th century, many people probably be, because people felt like um, this is probably too mechanical, uh, too dehumanized, too of uh, um, distance away from our visceral sense of reality and so forth. Um, so that mechanical aspect probably is uh, a bit alienating. But what is interesting now, now in, uh, in, in the 21st century, there's actually a revival of interest in this ethos. And so, it's, so I think we were doing the right thing uh, in the right time and, um, and, and uh, pick up where he kind of left off. So what the, the, the new step we took is to introduce the Buddhist perspective on this. In other words, this whole notion of uh, the kind of new mode of space and time that Mahalaji Naji articulated um, is actually closer or more akin to the kind of universe that Buddhists imagined. Um, so, uh, so this is the statue uh, that we have at Harbor, and it should be here, as you can see. Uh, well, I bring up this just to say that, in fact, uh, the Buddhist notion of um, medium is not taking the physical material medium that seriously. Uh, in fact, uh, you could see that there's an interplay between the painting and sculpture um, in ways that they kind of reflect uh, almost fungible, uh, uh, exchangeable with each other. They, in, in fact, they ch uh, try to mirror each other. But the point is not to give the ontological certitude to any of these medium, but rather to take them as just one of these uh, stop gaps to get uh, something else. So that's a key thing. So that's why China never had iconochasm, mainly because when they were creating this kind of images, they actually don't think that the images in and of themselves are the end points. They actually felt images are interesting mainly because they get you to feel something else. So in fact, there's a debate between the Taoists and Buddhists in medieval China that the, the Taoists say, well, you guys, how silly it is. You treat clay and wood so, so seriously. And the Buddhists reply, you don't get it. We don't actually treat them seriously. We, if they can get us to feel something more, then our end is met. Uh, so that's a, that's a key. So in other words, what we have here is a um, notion of uh, 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 body, space, um, um, material, ontology. They're all kind of uh, uh, interchangeable, and they never settle for one state. So that's the sort of um, thing that um, we, we sort of guide our design to some extent. So, um, and, and the same space that you know, we were being discussing um, would also feature uh, Vima Kirti, who essentially basically says that there's no such thing as the um, um, solid space because the most daring metaphor he proposed is that you could actually put chilicosm, the 3,000 word, uh, uh, the, you know, mirror worlds into one master seat and then through that seat into the empty void. So the whole point also that he was making is that just as we can deconstruct space, we can also deconstruct body male body can be female body, and so on and so forth. So um, that's a sort of framework, spatial temporal framework, in which this space that I earlier talked about um, is, is located and defined. So, um, so in the end, we come up with our space, and I think to some extent, is more faithful to the Buddhist imaginaire, the Buddhist sense of the universe, in which uh, nothing stands still, nothing is fixed, things are always in flux, in transformation, in process, 
uh, get trying to get into something else, right? So uh, one moment it's a body, another moment it's uh, abstract strokes and dancing forms, right? So with that, um, I want to close with a video about our lab, and so the dancing project is one of the many of our projects, but it's embedded in, the, in this video, all right, so. Welcome to visit our cave, uh, located in 485 Broadway, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and um, uh, look forward to hosting your visit. Thank you.